Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet wrapped in a pandemic, unfortunately, which has required us to do a lot more communicating online than some of, some of us would like. But the upside of online communication is that we can convene from a distance from anywhere in the world and uh, connect with you out there in the audience anywhere in the world as well. This is the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. It would normally be an annual walk around kind of a open house. This is the first day of open house this year and it's happening online. Although luckily we have Laurel Zaima here who will help you walk around in one of our actual facilities in a few minutes. I just wanted to start out, this session is the Monday sessions on my webcast here at the Earth Institute. I'm Andy Revkin. Are focused uh, on what we call thriving online. How do you connect impactfully? How do you how do you communicate science for sustainability that actually can make a difference in the world, and and that can be um, connecting your own research, uh, looking at the broader landscape of phenomena, and s finding new ways to communicate them to the public. Uh, it can be connecting through education, and we're going to hear about all that today. I just wanted to start with a little bit of a sonic and visual uh, adventure to take you into the frontiers of, of, of communication innovation as I see them. Hold on one second. Holy moly. <laughs> so uh, Ben, if you could unmute, uh, Ben Holtzman is a seismologist who is a, a research professor at Columbia University at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and a long time presence here. And Ben, so that <laughs> sounded like uh, heavy rain uh, coming in sporadic pulses on a summer day in the Hudson Valley or, or hail as Angie yeah. thought of it. But can you explain a little bit what we were just hearing? Yeah, sure. So that that was just a small number of the earthquakes that happened during the eruption of the Kilauea volcano in the summer of 2018. Everybody remembers the images of lava flows approaching, covering roads and approaching villages. And um, But what was happening on the surface of the crater, which was about 40 kilometers away from where the actual lava was pouring out, which was down this kind of rift flank, um, was this amazing sequence of cycles of, of building up. So these earthquakes would, every day there was a magnitude about 5, 5.1, 5.2. And that in that movie, that was the thud that you hear. Wow. And so every day this cycle started, built up with a few little ones, and they kind of build up to this crescendo, which is a thud, and then start over the next day. And I had never heard anything like that. And this was, it was actually, the pattern was so clear in the sound, um, but wasn't that obvious when you just look at, at the data, like just visually, you don't, you don't see that build up until you look really closely. And it was one of these examples where the sound led us to the pattern um, that we then kind of analyze further. Um, so, so this actually helps you in the research. It's not just sort of yeah. a cool way to, to look at things. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm going to play more. a little bit more, and then we're going to go. We're going to backtrack to sort of an introduction to what we're getting at here today. It's just the mind blowing. <laughs> Thank you. 
So anyone who thinks of Earth as a static and a static <laughs> substrate is missing some big dynamics. Oh yeah, and this is not just um, on top of a volcano like the islands of Hawaii. Uh, so let's let's widen out the view here a little bit and, and get going on our wider discussion of thriving online. It's it's wonderful today to have Angie Patterson here, who's a botanist focused on this and, and climate scientist focused at the interface of climate change and forest change who uses some interesting techniques to do her research, you know, that also involve loud sounds. Um, and uh, also Laurel Zama, who is the, uh, is the, one of the educators at, at the Earth, at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And she's coming to us live from the new field station down by the Hudson River. And wouldn't it be great if it was full of kids right now? You can, unpl you can unmute there now, Laurel. And we'll start with Laurel a little bit. Uh, yeah. So, hey, so can you explain a little bit about what your role is here at the at here? I'll say here, even though we're all in different places. <laughs> yeah. So I work at Lamont as the education and outreach coordinator. So the bulk of my job is working with scientists and taking their research and making it accessible for the public to consume, to um, teach to students, and also to help incorporate into the curriculum with teachers, so more people can understand this research being done here. Yeah, so and today, yeah, we're, we're down at the field station today. As you said, usually it's full of students and we love to have these investigations um, done live with the students. But of course, circumstances, we've had to kind of pivot and we've done a lot of work uh, virtually to bring people to the river if they can't come to the river and see us. <laughs> Well, it's great that you can show us around a little bit. And uh, you have a background. I remember seeing pictures of you as a, as a I could show it in a minute. Uh, there's this uh, organization called Terranauts. Um, you have a background in environmental education, obviously, but also you love uh, marine science, it sounds like, particularly. Yeah. How did, how did you get to become who you are? Oh, wow. So I, as a child, have always loved the sciences. I was definitely an outdoors kid. I grew up in Michigan, so I spent my summers out on the water, but in the Great Lakes. I actually used to unknowingly did tag and release with the turtles in our like little area. So I always loved the aquatic sciences. And when I was going to college, I knew I wanted to study marine science. So um, that path took me into a lot of undergraduate research, which I loved. Uh, but there was this component of research where you educate the public and I fell into this amazing niche where I felt like I was really great at communicating science and so I wanted to continue that. And of course, my background being marine biology, teaching and continually learning about the Hudson River is my favorite part of the job. Um, but I also volunteer with the Tiranaut Club, which is an incredible nonprofit organization focused on um, empowering young women in STEM, uh, specifically underrepresented minorities in the STEM field. So providing them these opportunities to do their own um, experiments and field investigations down by the water. We've done a lot of programs uh, in Miami where the, the president of the Terranaut Club and I actually met. And so we're happy to bring these science exper experiences to these young women. That's great. Um, it must be exciting now that there is a field station. You know, Lamont is perched up on, on, on the highlands there, essentially uh, up on the Palisades, literally. And now there's a place right down along the river. Uh, can you just maybe maybe now is a good time to show us around a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So our field station. Actually, I'll bring you guys on a little walking tour outside. Um, great. Our field station is located at the end of Piermont Pier. So I'm going to take you guys right outside here so you can see um, the beautiful water scene we have. And you can actually see the Palisade Sill right along um, kind of the backdrop there. So the pier extends Uh, Laurel, Laurel has frozen for a second. Uh, the outdoor uh, Wi-Fi may be uh, more limited than we would hope, but uh, you can see right there the idea that we're now directly linking Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory with the ocean part, which generally has happened on research vessels uh, and now has an actual um, facility at the waterfront is really exciting. And we'll get back to Laurel in a second. 
And uh, Angie, I wanted to get to you. You're up in New uh, in New Windsor, or uh, yep, I'm in New Windsor. Um, so you're basically right across the Hudson Valley from where I am in uh, Cold Spring. Uh, yep, a little bit north and and uh, near Black Rock Forest, where a lot yes. of new work has happened. Yeah, so I am about 20 minutes away from Black Rock Forest, uh, which is located in Cornwall, New York, um, and it is the site where I did most of my PhD research. Um, and is currently where I work there, work as a their um, master science educator. So um, right now I work um, with educators uh, K through 12 and beyond um, on bringing the forest to the classroom these days virtually. Um, but usually, uh, you know, school groups would come to the forest um, to learn about forest ecology um, in all aspects of it and uh, just be immersed in nature. And uh, there's a lot of team building and um, relationship building with nature while they're here. So. And um, I'm gonna show your Twitter feed because I wanna be sure everyone knows how to follow you. Um, yeah. Hold on one second while I do that. So it's a uh, colorful Sci girl, C-O-L-O-R-F-U-L-S-C-I. G I R L. What's interesting here to me, well, there's several things. Uh, one, of course, is you're, it feels like you're working hard to address something that Lamont is very focused on addressing right now, which is the lack of color, for better way of phrasing it, in earth science. That Absolutely. You, uh, as, as Coeli Dutt, one of the, the diversity officer at Lamont, wrote in a pretty breakaway paper a year or so ago, it's taken for over 40 years, uh, there's not really a change in black representation in, in the sciences that we all focus on here. So that feels like it's a key part of your, your outward focus. Absolutely. Um, I do believe representation matters. Um, and there's a, a myth that, you know, black indigenous people of color, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not found uh, to be in the woods or to be outdoors. Um, or to even be scientists um, in, in these environmental fields. But we're here. Um, we are uh, building networks constantly. Um, I think the recent uh, wave of these social media campaigns, um, such as Black Birders Week, uh, Black Botanist Week, Black in Nature, et cetera, um, really helped showcase uh, the the people that are behind the work of uh, exploring, um, you know, e e everything natural in the world, um, yeah. that we're enthusiasts. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a great platform to be able to share what we do. And what was your path? As I mentioned a minute ago with Laurel, I'd, I'd like to get people a sense of how you got in to be where you are today. You know, yeah. where did you grow up and what attracted you to plants? Particularly? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and then we'll get to the shotgun. Sure. I'll explain that in a minute. <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah, I, I uh, grew up in Pennsylvania in the Poconos. Um, so I was always immersed in nature, you know, it's pretty rural out there. Um, not much diversity either in that case, but um, uh, I actually never really thought plant working in the plant field or plant sciences uh, was a thing until I went to uh, undergrad at Cornell University. And, um, you know, I was, I went there pre predominantly to be a, a veterinarian because um, they have one of the best vet schools there. So um, after some uh, really challenging times academically, trying to uh, be a pre-vet, um, I kind of had to reassess my trajectory and I ended up taking this conservation biology course that totally changed my outlook. Um, I just love the questions uh, that that were asked, you know, about the environment, um, and it's it just seemed, you know, the the investigative nature of finding answers was really appealing to me. So that kind of uh, sparked my curi curiosity to, and uh, my trajectory to venture into this field. Were, were there mentors or other? I, I know. In a set, in essence, you and I are a potential mentor, a figure for others to say, "Oh wow, I can do that too." But for you, was there something that pulled you in that way, either as a woman or as a person of color? 
You know, at the time it was, um, I, I did, I wasn't really exposed to, um, many figures, uh, you know, that, that were out there exploring the world and answering these, uh, scientific questions about the environment. Um, and it was really the experiences and the opportunities that I took along the way that made me venture into, into the field deeper and find my niche. So, um, you know, I started, uh, working in the library system. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that I, I credit that to like my research, uh, experience and skills. Um, and then I ended up in a washing dishes as an undergrad in a plant cryobiology lab. So I, that's where I saw the science happening. Um, and, you know, occasionally I had to take care of plants. Uh, you know, I had to take care of the graduate students' plants. So I was uh, working in the greenhouse and I was like, wow, this is such a cool environment. And um, I was like, wow, plants don't talk back. This is kind of peaceful. <laughs> so I ended that up. Uh, yeah, so I ended up uh, liking it a lot and just taking one opportunity after after the other to explore more of this uh, field. Yeah, when I was in high school um, in Rhode Island, I guess there was a high school teacher. He was a former mar Marine who connected us with the Department of Natural Resources. And I, I grew up in Rhode Island. You know, the ocean was a big part of what I did. But I, I got a job kind of doing what you were just describing at a, a field station for the Department of Natural Resources, you know, maintaining stuff and washing things. And, and, and actually I took it unpaid. I quit a job pushing carts at the local supermarket to do this one summer. And my dad was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Quit, quitting a, a, you know, a, a paying job, mm -hmm. <laughs> cleaning the butcher's equipment at the supermarket to, 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 to work for the state for no money. But for me, it was at least a foot in the door. And then, you know, led to a lot of things for me too. So that finding that path and is important. Those first little steps yes. to connect you are important. And could you talk a little bit about social media? which we had a session on here a couple of months ago with some great scientists, including Kate Marvel and Jacqueline Gill up at the University of Maine uh, about the downside of being online, especially for women. Right, right. Um, but it, it was all about how to uh, limit online harassment and the like. But there is an upside and it's a pretty huge thing. So how is your experience, what's it been like? Oh, it's been, it's been a, a wild ride um, and you know, I, I actually wasn't that active on Twitter, um, uh, probably until 2018. Um, and I would post here and there. Um, I wanted to dedicate uh, Twitter to um, science. And it wasn't really until this past summer um, when, you know, Black Birders Week and, and things came along that I was like, oh, you know, let me explore a little bit more. And um, then, then uh, scientists, um, some some black uh, botanists actually got together, um, and I was involved in the, some of the initial conversation um, for Black Botanist Week, and right, right, right. Uh, I was like, yeah, I need to get involved. I need to just show you know show the world what I do too. Um, yeah. So I ended up doing that, and in a series of posts throughout the week. And it kind of blew up from there. All of a sudden, I had a lot, you know, a lot more followers, um, you know, right. coming to ask questions. And uh, uh, it, it was just great. Um, and it forced me to actually communicate my research in a way that was very succinct and uh, direct, short, um, right. you know, digestible. Uh, and I, you know, people, people like that, you know, if they can understand the science they can appreciate it and they can actually um, become advocates for, for the environment. And this gets to, uh, I, I actually, I'm going to ask you whether your tweeting is what resulted in the guardian doing a story about your work. I have to credit it. I have to credit the tweet. Yeah. Um, is there, that, <laughs> describe what's going on here because you're not shooting yeah. squirrels. I am not shooting squirrels. I'm not shooting turkeys. I'm pointing it up uh, to the, to the top of the canopy. Um, as a way to sample uh, my trees, I use a shotgun. And there's several different methods you can use to, uh, you know, get leaves off of a tree. You can climb um, a tree. You can use scaffolding, uh, which is very expensive. You can use a cherry picker. At the time I did my research, Black Rock Forest didn't um, own a, a cherry picker. Uh, they do now. But I was lucky enough that they didn't. So I had to uh, come up with 
uh, another method. And um, my advisor said that uh, shotgun is a, is a good way to do it. Uh, requires some skill, but along the way, um, yeah, it was very efficient, effective, yeah. cheap. And I, I gained the uh, nickname Angie Oakley after that. So, <laughs> and, oh, that I hadn't heard. And then so I'm just going to show the, uh, so that tweet essentially led to the guardian mm -hmm. and, and anyone who doesn't know the, I think it's Michael who came up with that eats, shoots and leaves. That was uh, an echo of, uh, it wasn't Michael Pollan. It was someone else who had this it's a joke about pandas or something eats shoots and leaves but he shoots <laughs> and leaves the shotgun scientist who hunts moving who hunts trees that are moving meaning yeah climate, climate is changing right yes it is yes it is um you know the trees don't they're they're not moving you know at, in the snapshot of a picture but um you know uh generally you know since the 1800s um you know and since really the the Remove the movement of the uh, glaciers and the ice caps. You know, trees have always dispersed um, through seed, and uh, and that's how they move. And so, um, you know, as these areas, uh, especially in this forest, get warmer, um, a lot of uh, trees will have to be able to live there, and they they have to either persist there, they have to either adapt, or, or if they can't adapt, they have to migrate. Um, to a more suitable climate. So um, yeah, that's my, my, my uh, main goal is to kind of sample different types of species uh, to see if they could physiologically um, acclimate or tolerate a changing uh, climate. It was, it was so interesting when I saw this uh, coverage of you and the tweet um, way, 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 way back, 1989, my first book was about um, the murder of a uh, an environmental, well, he was really a human rights campaigner in the Amazon rainforest. And I spent three months in the Amazon and I met Doug Daly, a botanist from the uh, New York Botanical Garden there in the middle of the, of the forest in Acre in the westernmost fringe of the Amazon. And we're walking down the uh, trail behind a rubber chapper and I saw these different uh, flowers and uh, flower petals and leaves on the on the floor of the forest and i was asking him looking we were looking at the trees and i said what's that species and he said i don't know he'd been working there for 20 years yeah said, i gotta go up there to find out <laughs> and he had those tree climbing irons that he strapped onto his um his the inside of your know, calves and you know climbing up the trees with uh, with all kinds of uh, ants stinging him and all mm. this looks like it's a lot easier than that. yeah I am not a tree climber, although you can hire them. So, um, yeah. you know, but I, I think uh, kind of taking ownership from of your research project from beginning to end is uh, this gives a little special meaning to the whole thing. Wow. So, Laurel, I, we had a little trouble there earlier trying to uh, go outside, um, but maybe you could show us around the uh, the innards of the uh, the field station a little bit. Yes, Thank you, Angie. We'll get back. To Sorry about here. that. The challenges of being in a. Oh no, it's not field station. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay, so I, I guess I'll start with some of the fish friends that I um, just went out and caught right off the beach here. Um, so this is one piece that we love to do with students is to um, engage them in some of the biology that lives in the Hudson. I think so often students that live in this area might not even realize that um, we have so much life and diversity that lives here. So we take them out into the water, they run a seine net, which is a net that has weights on the bottom, floats on the top, basically it creates a wall of net through the water and catches anything in its path. Um, and so today I just caught some silver sides. These guys are a schooling fish related to the flying fish. They get their beautiful name from this silver side on their, on their straight, their lateral line there. And so um, just a, a key species that we, we typically find right here off the pier. Um, at the field station, we also have this amazing um, invisible world set up connected to a giant screen. So no matter who is using the microscopes over here, everyone can have a chance to view it all at once. Um, yeah. So some of the key things that we're looking at in our invisible world, um, we actually have plankton that live in our section of the Hudson. So we'll take a water sample, put that water sample under these really easy to view microscopes called Wentscopes. And then students or the public, they have a chance to see um, what lives in this uh, invisible world, as we call it. 
We also are doing some research on microplastics. So that started last summer and we're hoping to continue looking at what types of microplastics are in this area, um, identifying them by, by shape and, and then subcategorizing them by primary microplastics, which are pieces that were manufactured to be small. So you can think of those as microbeads in your face wash or toothpaste. Um, or secondary microplastics, which are broken up from larger pieces of plastic through degradation. Um, and then of course, something that Lamont has a long legacy with is looking at sediment cores. And so we're also looking at sediment cores right off here in the Hudson. Um, we They're more shallow, not the deep ocean cores that the repository has, but um, our sediment, especially in this area right off the pier is so special. Uh, we are in this wide base section of the Hudson, which means that a lot of this sediment is slowing down and settling in this area. So when we take a core, it really tells us about the geologic and human influence that we've had on this area. So we'll find pieces of brick and concrete and coal. So it, it's fun because it not only tells you about the, the topography of the area and the history, but also how humans have influenced it as well. Yeah, so that's just a little bit about our field station. Um, we have so much more and really what we're all about here is about place-based education. So making sure that students and the public have the opportunity to do like full immersion into their investigation and the experience, the experiments that they're gonna conduct down here. So if you wanna learn more about the chemistry of the Hudson, we're gonna get your students down here and they're going to take their own water samples and uncover what the salinity or dissolved oxygen is like today. Um, so yeah, we're excited. We opened last year officially and hoping that when things return to our new normal, we're going to be having students in the public join us again. I'm just gonna show you something uh, from my reporting time at the New York Times about if anyone thinks there are just minnows in the Hudson River, they should um, think again. This was uh, up by Poughkeepsie uh, four <laughs> or five years ago. And I was along for a tagging tr uh, trip uh, with the Atlantic sturgeon. This was a small mm -hmm. one, seven foot, 120 pound male. And shortly the, in 2019, at National Geographic, I did a story when they used radar, I mean, sonar, special sonar. They, they spotted a 14 foot long female sturgeon that's likely 75 years old and had something like tens of millions of eggs in it. So the river is coming back in ways that are extraordinary. There's still huge losses. The shad is still mm -hmm. uh, greatly depleted, but uh, it's, it's amazing body of water. Absolutely. And that's one of our goals is that's me helping to release it. <laughs> gosh, I love surgeon. Speaking of surgeon, I do have to say we are working with a local artist who's creating a huge surgeon model for us. He's in oh, the yeah. process of painting it. So hopefully we'll have it in the next couple months that we can share on our social media. But yeah, sturgeon, especially in our area, they are um, such a critical species. They use this wide, shallow area, these wide bays that we call it, as an overwintering area. And juveniles spend the um, majority of their their youth growing and living in this area before they then migrate back out into the open ocean. Um, so yeah, sturgeon are amazing. And if we're talking about big fish, I'll just have to show our, our striped bass that we have here as well. So oh, this great. is our beautiful female striped bass. Ooh, hopefully you guys can see that the light's not bothering it too much. Um, yeah. So she was a actual fish that was caught by a local fisherman up in, I think it's Cornwall. And she is a pregnant female. This was caught many years ago. Um, of course, you wouldn't catch a fish like this now. Um, but it just also talks a lot about the spawning importance of striped bass and how striped bass are just such an iconic fish on the Hudson. And that there are so many environmental decisions that have been made to protect areas of the Hudson because they're critical spawning areas for striped bass. So we love to talk about our, our pregnant female striped bass up here and also just to show the size that they can get to, that you're absolutely right. When we say we're catching juvenile fish primarily, but there are huge fish that live in the Hudson as well. It's a, right. a thriving ecosystem for sure. And it's a, uh, people forget it's also basically a branch of the ocean. It's more of a fjord than a river, at least up through Albany. 
Right, right. It's this super dynamic and diverse ecosystem that has the influence from the ocean with salt threading its way up and, and the tides are constantly changing uh, the chemistry of the water as well. So really, when we have students down here, there's no better tool to better understand system science than just bringing them down to the Hudson and exploring it themselves. So Ben, when you think of the Hudson, uh, I'm sure you're thinking of the geology too. How, do, how, can, how, can you, how can you sit up in the Palisades and not be thinking about long time scales? And I, I wrote a song once about um, the area, I live in the Hudson Highlands and, and I looked up the age of the Highlands. Of course, there it was a, a billion years of time and toil or at, <laughs> in these old hills, so the Palisades. Yeah. Like, so, what was that? That that amazing. To me, it's just a failed, a failed rift. rift. <laughs> <laughs> like, the the Atlantic was Palisades. trying to open, um, and it started in the Hudson. Well, it kind of started to split there, and then that didn't quite work, and it yeah. jumped over to the Connecticut River Valley. That didn't quite work, and then it tried again, and finally the third, <laughs> third try. So, how long is it going Atlantic. to take for that <laughs> those highlands to be a lowland? That 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 Palisades is such a dramatic uh, spot. You, you just um, see it eroding every once in a while. A piece falls off. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I guess about ten years ago, there was a big a big chunk that fell down. Um, you can see it. It's I, actually it's probably not accessible easily, but it's kind of below the mot. But we have the oh, recording on the seismometer of its landing. That's on wild. The, on the river. Yeah. I'll show a picture of that in a minute. Yeah. Right. Here's a story that was. Oh, there. Hold on. I got to show this. This is pretty cool. Geology in action. <laughs> my colleague, uh, my former New York Times <laughs> colleague, is. Lisa Fotoraro. Um, I uh, wrote the story. Wow. So how old is that 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 terrain there, that piece of rock, that cliff? Oh, don't worry. No. Oh, my. I'm going to lose my job for this. It's probably <laughs> uh, yeah, it's probably 60 less. million years, I guess. No, don't worry about I mean, it. I'm going to lose my job. There won't, there won't be a quiz. <laughs> and, and maybe a student can uh, post it. <laughs> I, I've completely, I started in geology, but I, when I moved to geophysics, I, I, yeah. the uh, time scale Amazing. Kind of so let's blurry. get back to your, uh, <laughs> to your work a little bit. And then I'm going to circle back to Angie too on, and all of you on a couple more questions. Yeah. But Ben, what made you think about reaching out to the public in, in novel ways, as opposed to just doing the science? Um, it was funny, actually. It was it was kind of circumstantial. When I, I got to Lamont in two thousand four, in September, as a postdoc, and and that uh, Christmas, the day after Christmas, the Boxing Day earthquake, it's called, happened in in Sumatra with a magnitude nine point two, and that was just you know by far yeah. the biggest earthquake that had happened that I was aware of in, in my lifetime. And, you know, suddenly my division became this kind of media center. Like there were people being called to do interviews and, you know, it was like a, a real time need to know that I'd never experienced coming from a, a lab of rock mechanics studying the deep, deep earth physics and <laughs> no, no media ever right. came to ask us what we were doing. <laughs> um, and suddenly this kind of societally important um, event happened. And um, let's see, the next summer, a friend of mine, we were in a band together. He asked me if, if we could hear earthquakes. Mm -hmm. And I realized, I thought about it, and I was like, no, the frequencies are just way too low below our audible range. But, but I, I said, we can speed some of the data. We can take the data and speed it up and bring it into our range of hearing and listen to it. And, um, and so when we got back from, we were on, on a tour um, 
we got back and and I did that and we started and the sounds were just incredible. Um, they were way beyond what what I imagined what they they would be. Um, especially so an earthquake that big right. has an incredible range of frequencies and on the very long long period low frequency end you start hearing these things that sound like like whale calls and like bells ringing and these kind of constant pitches that are that are so beautiful um that's amazing and so we realized that we could take we could take a ring sort of seismometers that are located on a ring around the planet and listen to them and basically listen to the whole planet ringing as a bell in response to being hit with this magnitude nine earthquake. And um, so we did that for open house in 2005. Wow. And just, uh, we got eight speakers and set them up on chairs in a ring and people sat on the floor and listened to them. <laughs> and like, you know, we would do these kind of 15 minute spiels till we dropped and there were people who would just sit there and like go like, through several spiels and were blown away by these sounds and we That's um, incredible. so we just kept doing that and eventually got it into the planetarium at the natural history museum and um yeah so it just kind of grew into this into this thing and kind of turned me into a sort of seismologist <laughs> and now you know i i hadn't realized that you were in a band and now that means you have to come on one of our sunday shows because every <laughs> sunday we have uh you know it's all about music uh, so, oh really I yeah know. yeah well, now, now you know and that means <laughs> yeah. uh, there, i'll i'll be in touch we okay. just had we just had a, actually a neighbor of lamont was just on yesterday tom chapin who's oh, a, really? a great oh, folk wow. singer and he uh, yeah he was on the show yesterday. He, he oh, wrote this. Wow. He wrote a song about his uh, his in law Wally Broker, who's uh, one of the great scientists at Lamont who passed away recently. So uh, yeah, we will. Uh, and actually, I want to show you show one more clip. This is actually let me make sure I got the right one here from my friends at uh, at the um, oh, but I bet I didn't do the sound thing. Hold on, I always fail to do the little click the button for audio. Hold on, let's get this right. So yeah, I'm still affiliated with National Geographic. I'm on the Committee for Research and Exploration there. I worked there for um, a year, not long ago. And uh, they did a um, presentation with you or about your work. Yeah, they did a really nice little movie. Can you all hear this? The question came up of whether you could hear earthquakes. And, and I said, I don't think think so but we could take the data and speed it up and listen oh, to the yeah. whole planet ring broken yeah. record <laughs> it's fine <laughs> the seismodome show is a ongoing project in which we the tohoku earthquake i remember when i covered the uh this earthquake there was a uh, a quick turnaround sonification of it that I had heard, mm -hmm. which even had the two little four shocks. And so in the show, we have a magnitude seven, you know, and that energy dies out in about a day, whereas a magnitude nine or higher, the earth is ringing for about three months. Three months. Wow. <laughs> With every passage of a seismic wave through the Earth, we get a little more information about the structure of the inside. We're always playing with time. So we'll always say, this is seven years of earthquakes. You're going to hear it in a minute. That means just the list of earthquakes, where they were and how big they were and how deep they were. We want to give people a, a sense of how small we are, how short our lifetimes are. And hopefully they walk out of that planetarium with a very altered sense of their lives and our roles on, on Earth. 
Well, they certainly, certainly would. Um, so this, this leads to another question I have. Um, hold on, I'll just stop that and my ears will be full of it. <laughs> so the, this is the adjustment we've all had to make to online interaction with people. Uh, as Angie explained, obviously Twitter and the like are implicitly online. Uh, Laurel, the challenges of a field station are different yeah. with remote education. Uh, or hybrid education evenly uh, and, and you know you can't have a planetarium for your shows right now but but there are ways to take on the uh, the upside of this world that we're all connecting through and I wanted to get your sense of uh, where you are with that transition I mean we'll, here we are seven or eight months into an unbelievable uh, yeah. shock, shock to the system, not yeah. seismology, but biology. And it's going to be transforming things uh, that are not just temporary. It's not like anyone who thinks we were going back to some normal is fantasizing, right? Yeah. So maybe we'd start with Angie in the sense of, you know, when you think whether it's through the um, outreach you do or any teaching you do, or even the science you do, uh, what's different now than March 15th? And we'll, and we'll talk to <laughs> all of you about that for a minute. Yeah, uh, coming on to the job at BlackRock in February, I was uh, just about to meet with uh, uh, teachers and going go to schools and visit classrooms and um, work, you know, work to see how we can get more of their classrooms to the forest. Um, and I only had a, got a chance to visit one school in New York City before the shutdowns happened. Um, and then uh, it was, you know, a lot of educators uh, were kind of scrambling to transform their whole, uh, you know, curriculum to this online format. Um, and, you know, the forest had to kind of think about, you know, we got, we usually have these kids come, you know, thousands of kids come every year to the forest and, um, and that's no longer. And so uh, we had to figure out well, how can we bring a slice of the forest to them? Um, you know, and so we decided to, uh, you know, invest a little bit into some uh, video equipment, um, go online, see what platforms exist, uh, join, you know, other networks uh, of, of educators um, to kind of come up with some solutions. And so with that, you know, uh, we created a YouTube channel um, and we invested in like a 360 GoPro uh, camera as well. Um, and I use my trusty cell phone uh, sometimes to uh, go out and take some walks in the woods. And um, even, you know, it got me thinking, like, how can we transform our curriculum to this online format? And so, you know, started with the basics, like what, you know, how can we maybe film uh, a lesson on what the kids would do if they were out here? And so one of our first videos was on, um, what vernal pools are, uh, uh, why they're important uh, in the forest and how, uh, what creatures live around there. And we focus on salamanders and we videotaped, you know, lifting over logs and how you would actually um, uh, survey, you know, these, the species. Um, so that was, uh, that was, that was very exciting. And, and it actually helped a lot of our educators out. Um, and Yep. Um, and I think this video is probably uh, someone who's coming to the forest uh, for hiking. Oh, so um, this is not one of yours. This is not, not this one is of not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we, we actually, if you type in uh, Black Rock Forest um, in, in YouTube, you'll actually see our, our channel. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, so, so we started off with that kind of these video lessons. Um, and educators were able to kind of incorporate that video into. Um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but there's a platform where they can use it and they can kind of insert questions along the way to their students and, um, and kind of quiz them on the content. So that was nice. Um, and then we also got requests to um, uh, kind of just do a silent hike uh, because that's a lot of part, you know, part of the attraction to come into the forest is just to, you know, forest bathe in a sense, you know, and, have this peaceful, mindful uh, experience. And so um, 
another video that I shot was a mindfulness hike around uh, Alec Mayo, which is uh, one of the reservoirs up here. Um, and, you know, the feedback from that was like, it, it was it was amazing. Yeah, a lot of the students who were who had visited said that they missed coming to the forest, you know, oh, and interesting. Yeah. Um, so that was that was really nice and really rewarding. Um, so the next, you know, the next step for me is, um, you know, our mission is to advance uh, uh, understanding of, of the forest through science. And so um, how can we uh, get our data set online? Um, and we have we have a lot of data sets already. Um, however, there's some there's some data sets that are not quite accessible. So I would love to be able to kind of collate data, make it accessible to classrooms so that they could play around with the numbers, create graphs and learn about that type of science, scientific inquiry. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm just um, yeah. playing that out with the 360 walkthrough. This is pretty cool. Yeah, so you can actually, uh, so, so the um, person I worked with, uh, Laurel Schuster, um, she uh, had a bike helmet we attached the GoPro to the top of the bike helmet and just press record. And she uh, went around the uh, upper reservoir in this, in this video. Mm -hmm. um, and there's another video on uh, uh, her climbing Black Rock Mountain Summit, which is the, probably one of the more uh, famous uh, places to visit the forest. And you can see um, the valley and West Point and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it also, you know, allows the public, you know, who, who couldn't come to the forest to just see what exists there and what can they see in the video? You know, there's a deer that passes, uh, in one of the videos and, uh, oh, really? yeah, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, vegetation exists? You kind of make it like a scavenger hunt, you know, for, for students and teach them how to observe. Um, so, yeah. So what would be Laurel, uh, you know, thinking about the, the field station in the context of the online environment, uh, what have you been doing or thinking about to kind of build that, sustain that connectivity? Yeah, oh, you're, you're it's muted. been I'm challenging. Yeah, okay. okay, you're good. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, it's definitely been challenging, of course, with our mission, bringing people down to the water. We can't do that. Um, but as Angie said, I think um, we, pivoted really quickly and we decided we're going to bring the river to the students if we can't bring them to the river. So uh, we have done a lot of video explorations and focusing on phenomena that students can then investigate themselves at home. And um, we had a group of students this summer that were interns with us and they were going to be uh, investigating the river and then creating educational outputs to then share with their community to more widely uh, connect people to the Hudson. And of course, all of our in-person things needed to be rethought, but we still had these investigations. I would come to them live from the river and, and we would do things together. Me kind of just being, uh, they would tell me and I'd be their eyes kind of helping them lead through these experiments. And then we, instead of being able to in-person work with their community, we, put a value on social media and we had them use these different communication tools that are so popular and such an amazing way to connect all of us and had them create these educational TikTok or Instagram or YouTube videos that they can then share, not just with their immediate community, but to everyone that's online and hit these different generations. Oh, so, cool. so yeah, so, you know, the younger generations using TikTok and Instagram, but we also looked at longer, more uh, in-depth YouTube videos for, for other people that want to take a deeper dive. And this was completely in the hands of the students. So they were able to incorporate their creativity, their graphic design. Uh, it was really, it ended up being an amazing project. And you're right, there is this silver lining of this unique situation that we're in where we can actually create these um products that can live on for much longer than than a one-time lesson can so it's 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 a wonderful opportunity for especially those who wouldn't be able to come down to the field station to have that experience it being brought to them yeah is there an easy way for folks uh, to find some of that is there yeah. a tag or a you can go to our website it's uh blog.columbia 
dot I'll have to put the it's a it's a longer URL sure. uh, and then there were also two Save the Planet blogs that the students wrote as their final project where they basically spoke about what they learned from this experience of creating different communication outputs and so there's two blogs one's focused on uh, communicating itself communicating science and then one was focused on um, uh, environmental justice and and those two blogs are on the state of the planet uh, Earth Institute website. We can also link those as well. That's great. And um, folks can Lamont Earth is the um, is the uh, Twitter at Lamont Earth is the Twitter tag or ID for uh, the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And I'll show folks the, uh, the general website here just so they can see. Oh, perfect. there's a lot going on. It's a, this whole week, of course. Uh, if you, if those out there who are listening, you can tune into um, go to lamontrocks.com, shortcut to all the activities going on this week. Uh, I mean, this is just one of the first things on this special day as we start to kick off this uh, this way to engage the public, no matter where you are on planet Earth. Um, you can be part of the conversation. You don't have to just live along the Hudson River. So get in touch with us. And that scrolling bar at the bottom is another way to get in touch with ideas going forward. So uh, I want to kind of cut toward the uh, close here with the, just a round of sort of next steps um, and any ideas we might have to uh, take things forward a little bit. You know, I'm at the Earth Institute Initiative on Communication and Sustainability. And part of what I'm trying to do internally is galvanize cross-sectoral, interdepartmental, transdisciplinary, you know, you know, all the words, uh, connectivity around communication. As I said, I'm going to force Ben to think about coming on our Sunday show. So that's one next step. Um, and then, but for the others here, uh, what would be a way to take, take this forward a notch? Like even next week after we were recuperating from open house, if there's some conversation we had that, where I could help or someone else could help uh, with some of the things you're working on, what might be on that list? And I don't want to prompt you to force you to think too much in too short a time scale, but uh, if there's anything that's come to mind just even in our conversation so far, it'd be fun to uh, think about that. So uh, I don't know, Angie, uh, can I help you with anything or uh, is there something you can help Laura with or you know, where do we go from here? Yeah, I would love to collaborate with everyone on this chat to kind of uh, bring science to um, students and to the public for sure. Um, you know, I think just uh, trying to be creative and using our online platforms for now. I mean, the, I think the benefit of the upside of this this whole thing is that we are able to reach people who are just not in New York. You know, they are, uh, you know, we're reaching people who are around the world. Um, I'll just no. I'll just tell yeah. you that we got a comment in from Dilly Raj Subadi, who, when he was seeing and listening to the earthquake sonification, he said, "I have also real experience, 2015 in Nepal." So, you're right. We are reaching uh, around the world right now. That's really that's cool. amazing. Yeah, and it's so so. It's like we're we're no longer you know static in in one place, and um and so this is this definitely has opened up the opportunities to collaborate uh, with all different types of uh, communities, organizations. Um, so that's kind of what, where I'm looking at, you know, how can we make uh, linkages, um, connections, uh, the upside for Black Rock Forest, you know, we, we actually connected, um, we're, we're part of the organization for biological field stations. Um, and I'll give a plug to this. Uh, they, they, they recently won a grant um, in the summer, uh, a, COVID-19 NSF rapid grant to uh, educate or to, to kind of build a platform of uh, virtual videos, habitat videos uh, to um, help, uh, you know, professors or educators kind of teach their students about um, ecosystems and, and unique features of ecosystems. And BlackRock was part of uh, the first nine videos to be uh, um, included in that uh, list. Um, and so they have a, a website, um, the, vir the virtual field.org, I believe, um, mm. where you can actually go and, and look at these, uh, these videos and uh, teachers can actually download these education guides. Um, students are prompted with questions. Um, so just building curriculum uh, in this uh, collaborative, uh, you know, way, I think is uh, kind of the next way to go. 
You said it's virtual field? The virtual field.org. Great. I'll try to show that before we're done. Yeah. Um, and, and Ben, for you, uh, well, one thing we haven't talked about yet is, is our colleagues. You know, um, one of the things I'm trying to do is foster the capacity for those who are already excited about some new frontier in communication to spread the gospel. Uh, we did a, I did a survey here right after I started a year ago to see what's the general landscape of engagement with engagement. And um, about a third of the respondents, faculty students were enthusiastic about social media, for example, and a third, well, maybe 20% were kind of what they call hes hesitant, but hopeful. <laughs> I mean, and, and I think the more we can connect those who are enthusiastic with those who are hesitant and, but hopeful, there, there's more of a sense of widening the landscape here. So I'm happy to help build uh, internal conversations or sort of workshops around some of this going forward too, so that everyone is aware of you know, what's possible. And, and Ben, and Ben, in your, in your area, in this sort of yeah. seismological, geological arena, are you still kind of an outlier or do you feel like there's a, a substantial community <laughs> at that interface between the public and the science? I think if I, if I stopped being an outlier, <laughs> well, then, flee. Right, then it wouldn't be cool. <laughs> uh, well, but I was thinking as you were talking about our colleagues, a lot of the excitement for outreach comes from the grad right. students and, and they train their advisors often, both in collaborations. That's a lot of what happens at Lamont is, you know, our collaborations happen through, through the grad students and postdocs, but, but the enthusiasm for outreach, I think as, as Laurel was talking about, you know, the power of short movies to generate, well, both of you guys, Angie too, like, um, especially like that power generates so much curiosity so quickly and then you can keep digging and I think that one of the um, one of the the things that is not going to change as we you know in the new normal is this expectation to have access to information from all over the world at any moment as part of your education. So when we go back to the classroom, kids are still going to have laptops and they're going to know how to get to those movies anywhere and find, find forest walks, you know, and those forest walks will be part of the science class, even when we're back in the classrooms and having that kind of access is is not going to change. It's like we're we're forced to bring this this medium into our lives very quickly, um, but there's no reason that we're going to stop doing that. Um, no, it, it, it's it's a great. I think you're all pushing the the boundaries of really important questions uh, that that are, are again not they're not a question with an answer. They're a question that sets one on a journey, mm -hmm. and it's iterative and there'll be mistakes and there'll be embarrassment <laughs> and sometimes there'll be harassment as we said earlier you know we, those skills are important ones to 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 develop as well and i'm glad we're going to try to do some more sessions on that part of the online landscape uh, but there are really inspiring prospects here and that that forest walk that 360 virtual forest walk is a fantastic one the seismological Dynamics uh, that Ben is, and colleagues have worked on are fantastic. And the field station, including the evolution toward um, an online dynamic, uh, especially what you were just saying, uh, Laurel, about students generating their own content. You know, that's, that's the thing that is even perhaps the most valuable possibility where they become the inquirers and the recorders and the sharers and where we're not just like putting stuff out. So this has been a wonderful um, session of our thriving online Monday sessions of uh, what we try to do here. And I thank you all for, for being here. And I hope maybe we can come back and revisit in a, you know, in a couple months and do another, it doesn't have to wait till open house to, to do more of this. Um, I'm going to show people something uh, on Wednesday. If everyone goes to lamontrocks.com, you'll see that 
I'm running a session here on the frontiers of climate journalism. And then on Friday, I'm doing another one with some of our people and some others on the law and climate science. And when politics and law and climate science collide, this is Friday at 1 p.m. with Michael Mann, one of the most prominent climate scientists right now, who's uh, who had to rely on the climate uh, science legal defense fund at Columbia. And, and I mean, they're that group and, and colleagues at Columbia when he was being harassed uh, in the courts. Adam Sobel, one of the, of the climate scientists here, will be on as well. And Romany Webb, who's at the law school. So uh, the conversation continues here every every week on Sustain What. This is Andy Revkin. Uh, came to Columbia a year ago. I'm really happy to be able to do what I can online and on the campus when we can to foster communication impact with a thriving planet and, and thriving equitable societies in mind. So thanks to my guests today, Laurel Zema, uh, Ben Holtzman, and Angie Patterson. Keep up the great work. Uh, stay safe and connected from a distance. Vote. <laughs> vote, vote, vote. <laughs> Only once <laughs> per person, but make sure you get that done. And uh, thanks again for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was fun. Lamont rocks. Yeah. <laughs>